doing your classes? How oh, you're doing agile? How are you doing your uh, estimation and scoping? And it's like um, they're expecting me to answer, ah, we use this technique that allows us to magically be able to estimate within 5% or, or be better at estimating or be better at scoping. And it's, uh, it's like a disappointment for them when they say, well, I probably know better you than you at estimating a project. If you tell me, so given the scope, tell me how, how much it will cost. I probably know better than you. Um, so it's not the estimation or the skills you know, that we have. But in, in Agile, are there any, is there anything um, that makes you better? There is, but it's not estimation. It's not estimation. I mean, you know, in, in, in construction, you find uh, books. I don't know how many of you know a little bit on the construction. There are books which tells you how much uh, concrete needed, how many stones needed for a uh, one kilometer road of this grade. It's very well defined. Yeah, and uh, it even tells you if it is in a tropical climate this much, if it is in a temperate climate this much, in a winter road this much. And it's defined, but there is no tool, no book, no methodology and anyone trying to sell you one don't <laughs> because there's just no way to estimate it right up front because remember the first thing i say is the user can only tell you what they want after they have experience use and use more in fact a successful software is that which continuously has more needs you should be worried about the software after you have delivered and if your users are not asking anything because they're not using. If they were using, they will ask you 500 more items. Okay, that's that's the reality of life. So, okay, going back. So, what did those guys? Those actually there is a photo. Uh, they look with a lot of beer drinking guys. Look at that. Uh, so, anyway, they they met. They talked about uh, how many days was that? There was a bunch of days. They uh, finally they closed the door. They, they spent a week, they said, a winter in Aspen. Yeah. They met up. They said, um, because and, and the reason for that is, the, the reason why they met up was, first, the way they were doing, which is what we're doing, traditional, traditional software development, um, they started looking for alternatives. And then they started seeing, uh, the alternatives that they found, they have common threads. They, they have common features the way they were basically uh, alternatives and then you see oh this guy's trying to do it another way but um, the way he and I are doing it um, have similar characteristics so they decided to meet up and say well okay this new things that we found uh, maybe we can define it and, and make it more explicit they actually had more things that they did not agree upon yeah. uh, then they agreed so uh, that, that's a short list of what they agreed upon. Do yeah. you want to take that through the idea? Yeah, okay. So uh, basically they came up with what's called the manifesto, which is kind of weird for some people. Why, why is it like a political statement? Because it summarized, even though the things that they're doing might be different, what they started believing in was very much the same. So they said, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it. So it's based on actual experience. That's what they did. And then helping others do it. A lot of them are consultants, so they help others build software. Through this work, we have come, we have come to us individuals and interactions through our process. Um, working software is a comprehensive document. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over software. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, so um, there's a common misunderstanding about agile. It's not that we don't manage processes and tools and all these things on the right. It's just that we put more value in the So it's not as if we're saying we, in agile we don't have any processes or we don't have any tools. Uh, it's more like we value individual feedback, more than that. Because some people think agile means lazy. 
Yes. It it's, means, it's not oh, it says comprehensive. Do you don't have any comprehensive documentation. Let's not do any documentation. <laughs> That's not what Agile is saying. Agile, what Agile is saying is between documenting something and making sure that it works, I would value making sure that it works. <laughs> Like, you know, I mean, we, we just talked about that side document, right? I mean, just in a percentage, since most of you come from Waterfall, what percentage of time do you spend on the two activities in the beginning, which is requirement and design? What percentage of your project do you spend on that? 40%? Yeah, 30 to 40%, I guess. How much of it really get used by the time the product is released and accepted? How much percentage of it really gets used? Okay. I've also heard of projects. <laughs> this one is a government project. Where basically the, the timeline was a year. And the documentation, the requirements gathered, started, I think it was estimated initially at around four months. But it basically ended up something like eight months. And the budget was for a year. And so, in time for development, it got squeezed in and squeezed. And so, what can you expect out of that kind of project? So, that's a very common thing that I've experienced in my career. Where the requirements, they never, the users can't agree on the requirements. That's why they extend them, they extend. And then, you don't have enough time to do the actual development. And then, the quality of the software delivery suffers because of it. There was a phase when uh, the CMMI method, I don't know, how many of you are using CMMI? Anyone? No, good. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> because, you know, the CMMI went the other way. It said, write everything down and enforce it. It was an enforcement way. Well, CMMI is changing now, but it was the enforcement way. What they did is, they made sure the provider doesn't lose money. Okay, a good a CMMI five uh, provider doesn't lose money when you, your users go crazy. It's the company which loses money. That's what CMMI actually ensures. Uh, it ensures the documentation is detailed and every change can be built for. That's what it ensures. So, but. It might be good for the contract you are in unless they pre-terminate and give you a good money. They will never work with you after that, most of the time. Okay. Now, okay, I am very biased, right? No. <laughs> but yeah, that one is the other end of agile. Uh, as much as possible, document it so you can get paid for the work you did. That's the whole idea behind that. Um, working software comes yeah. in, in Agile, in the end, what we realize is um, what we should think, the way we should think about requirements and the requirements documents is that they are intermediate artifacts. In the end, what is really important is whether the software is working. Okay. Means to an end. It's, uh, the documentation is a means towards building that. It shouldn't become the most important thing that we need to sign off so that we can control the scope. It's more like, in the end, what's important is the running software. Now, uh, the other the other thing, like customer collaboration over contract agreement. If you've been through a bloody discussion with a client about the scope, like is this out of scope, in scope, in the end, um, what we sometimes forget, being the providers, is there's a reason why they want that. So it's not a matter of, okay, yes, according to the contract that we initially agreed on, uh, you, didn't, you didn't say that we needed this, but now you realize that you need this. And so it's like, by focusing on those things, and, by, and usually what happens in, in, in actual project is you build a process where um, you have to go through this change control committee, you then estimate, you then, and sometimes that process alone takes up more time than actually making the change. So there's overhead in that as well. So 
what this is saying is really, I think there's something wrong there. You have to put in a lot of processes to basically satisfy what, what, what we need to understand is there's a reason for those changes coming in. Uh, and I think as software developers, we need to understand where the customer is coming from. This is why customer collaboration becomes very important. A lot of time, the real software starts actually at the UAT. By the time you show them, that's the time they really absorb what you are saying you're going to give. And that's the time the whole iteration starts. Uh, what Agile talks about is starting that day one. So forget requirement, forget design, forget coding even. Start the collaboration with your users day one as much as possible. We'll go through that how and how it to be done. So, but basically, so um, the reason for Agile is because it, it comes about as a dissatisfaction of the current process. Yes. And one of the things that we need to focus on, or at least my understanding of Agile, comes from the fact that one of the reasons why the design, I don't know, the requirements, design, coding, testing, and deployment phases, um, why projects go around. Right. It's not because those activities are not valid. In fact, you they're very important activities. No? Requirements gathering, design, coding, testing, uh, deployment are all very important projects. What we need to do, the problem is that we discover the what the problems are at the end, right? During the testing or even during the deployment. No? So what Hajar is saying, well, the problem is really about feedback. It's like, it takes so long to get feedback that by the time that you realize, ah, we need to change this, there's no more, the time the project should be done by that point. What, one of the things that, that um, Agile is doing, even things like RUP is doing, is introducing the concept of iterations. So, early, early iterations. Early iterations, so the idea that um, if we can compress the cycle and get feedback pretty well, then the client won't be surprised anymore that if, a, let's say, we have a year-long project or a six-month project, um, it shouldn't be that eight months or nine months into it, that's when they see um, the results. No? If we can, if we can show them within the first month, for example, oh, some sort of feedback already where they can start inputting that and incorporating that into the project. Then at the end of the year, when your software is finally completed, then they won't be surprised. Ah, okay, that's what we're getting. Because even at the start, they already started seeing, um, they're starting to see the software as it's being built. And that's one of the key concepts I think we have that The idea that the earlier that you can show the customer, you can work with the customer to show them what you're building as you're building it, the more that you, they can, or, incorpor you can incorporate their feedback, and the more that you can steer the project to what they need. Right. You know, I mean, just to share, I started in construction project in 92. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, after AIM, I went into consulting industry, and we were doing consulting projects. So all of this were all fixed price projects. And then when we started um, on, the, on the IT side, uh, 99 onwards, so we did projects, and we actually did some projects successfully fixed price, some very large government projects successfully uh, within the budget and more or less within the time frame. But then they find success. Because we had a lot of blood and sweat everywhere falling around, right? Uh, I mean, it just takes a lot of pain. And no one is happy. Neither were we happy, neither were the user happy, and the developers were never happy. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so actually, it's my, it's my uh, quest in trying to figure how this beast can be managed. So I actually went through the whole, we went through about three years effort to go for CMMI. 
and I actually I am also certified PMP. Uh, I teach project management using PMP at AIM also. I am still teaching uh, in certain different programs. And we were using it at uh, Blast Asia rigorously and, and you know trying to tune, fine tune it from academic and real money interest. But it just did not work too well. It's it's painful, it just doesn't work when it's water polish. Even if you include hydration in between, um, it's still a pain. And end of the day, the idea was I said like you know, your client should be happy. Your developer should be happy, and you as a company should be happy having, I mean, of course, not super happy, but at least you need to have break even and make money. Okay, that's that's the basic. And somehow, we were not being able to reach there, all those three states being happy. Um, that's why it started Agile in 95, actually 95, 96. We started on uh, Agile, we started trying around. And probably that's the time around you guys also uh, started, and. We, we actually exchange a lot of time, thoughts, and ideas, what works, what doesn't. In fact, we were just talking about how do you evaluate um, your developers and everyone in an agile setup. But that's another topic for another day. Let's move to the next part. So this is how the triangle is reversed. So this is the waterfall. So what happens is the client's responsibility is supposed to be to define the features. All the features in the system they want you to build, they're supposed to define it well, right? And once they define that, you create the plan for the cost and estimate and you kind of manage this, right? That's the theory on the waterfall, yes? In the Agile, you turn it around the other side. So you, together of course you make certain ballpark estimate and the cost and schedule are actually somewhat fixed up front and it's the client's responsibility. It's like, I say it's like, you know, you go for a taxi and you sit and say, bring me to the airport. And if there is flooding or there is a, uh, you know, the tire is broken or anything, that's the problem of the driver. The other one, is more of you give them a rental. You give them a good car, but you know they're the one driving. They're driving the cost and schedule. If you take the long way, you'll burn more gas. That's your problem. But we'll, we'll make sure it's a comfortable ride. Uh, the features are in this one. What we are talking about? It's not the fixing the feature, but ensuring the objective of the feature is met. The process should ensure that your team, through its engineering and practice, ensure the value is reached uh, for whatever the business proposition or whatever use the software is supposed to do, it's doing it. Want to add anything on that? Yeah. Um, what are the things that, that distinguishes, I guess, um, Agile and Waterfall is the fact that most of them actually recognize this this uh, the, the, the triangle, uh, you have a fixed call, um, basically the things that determine the successful project are the cost, the schedule, and the features. Now it's just that if you, for example, in in the problem with with, uh, with waterfall is they tend to say, well, the fixed the these three things are fixed. But what the reality is, as we go and develop. Um, it either is even if there's no major changes in the in the in the, in the scope. You know, what usually happens is we discover things that, for example, ah, it's much harder to implement this and it will take longer. But we didn't know that at the time. Or it can be that uh, there's a lot of reasons: technology, complexity of the, the application, and basically we end up estimating wrong. And we kept analyzing. And that's why what's our tendency in, 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 uh, in waterfall is when we propose, we add buffers. Everyone adds buffer. Everyone, starting from the developer adds, yeah. the PM adds, and, and the boss adds. And the thing is, most of the time, 
buffers work, and why? That's why there's still success in, in waterfall because if you add enough buffers, you can fall under budget. Yes. Yeah. But the problem is sometimes every time it is, you get these uh, situations where the buffer isn't enough. But the client is so strict on the features that you then have these overruns. Now, what I'm just saying with is we need to work together. Um, because one of the things that what we realize in, in, in the way things are usually structured in, in uh, projects is, for example, what's the output of a requirements gathering um, phase? It's usually something we call the uh, business, we, we start out with something called the business requirements specification, and we translate that into what? The the SRS, the System Requirements Specification, and it's a monolithic document. It says these are all the things that are needed for the system of work. The reality is, when you start working with a client, you start realizing they do have priorities. Some things are more important, and, though, and, and to some extent we recognize that. We say these are the must-haves, these are the not so uh, important, and these are the optional. So we, we do, to some extent, recognize that, but we're not recognizing that. When we write a document and we estimate and we say, what Ajahn does is say, well, you can have fixed uh, budgets and fixed timelines here, but the scope can be negotiable. Can you choose? You choose what you want. You, you choose what you want. You can say, well, the, the features are fixed, but you gotta give us some leeway with regards to the schedule of cost. So there's there's this reality, accepting reality that we don't always we can't predict projects, and there's gotta be some leeway for us to adjust. And the way we adjust is is driven by the fact that we keep the feedback cycle going, and we need to adjust the project as it goes along. One of the things that I have a problem with with um, traditional projects is we build these gigantic Gantt charts, these complicated Gantt charts that really, uh, like at the start, it's as if, and then the project manager starts Looks by, good, though. Looks good, <laughs> yeah. It's like you can define that you will build this screen in three days. And then when the reality comes in and you start seeing, oh God. And do this in And then you see there are three new browsers with HTML5 yeah, or whatever, yeah. something doesn't support something. And that three days can become three months, actually. Yeah, and, and so that's the thing. It's like back to the actual software. So the problem we have with that is not so much that uh, it's like planning it out to that detail is it wrong. It's that we can't manage it or maintain it all throughout the life, the life of the project. What usually happens is Somebody gets it to the start, and then maybe at the start somebody will start updating, and then somewhere along the line you throw it out, and nobody really maintained. And, and, and the thing was, uh, I remember like going back to a project that was already done, and I said, oh, I want to show you this. Remember, this is the original, and this is what oh, yeah. actually happened. And it's like, the gap between that plan and the reality was so wide. And the other thing was, Nobody went and did the project, which is a typical thing. Nobody. The reality is that document gets thrown away. Yeah. What do you do on the requirement gathering so and SSR? What Angela is saying is it recognizes that the plan, the plans can change, that the situation can change, and therefore the plans must be updated. And the techniques that we're going to show you basically help recognize that reality. That okay, here's a planning tool that you can use that's easy enough so that as things change, it gets reflected in the plan. And it's part of the process. So it's like recognizing that change is part of the process and incorporating into the software development like that. Any questions so far? Yes. I have a question. Um, based on your experience, have you had any uh, problems saying that idea to customers uh, because if, if I were to put my myself in the yes. of customer <laughs> the short answer is yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're telling you now we don't have to finish it's never easy and I'm telling you at this time 
from the last four years, I have no local projects. Because I say either agile or none. And most of them tell me none. And that's why. <laughs> So, um, well, in contrast, yeah, while we do have um, offshore clients, we do have local clients um, where we have done, where we were able to convince them. And I guess the easiest way to convince them is to get a successful project where the client is happy, the developers are happy. And if you have that, and you can go tell them, well, in your previous vendors, were you guys happy? And it, more, more often than not, they'll say no. Well, take a look at our cloud. So re reference. Generally small project to start. Yeah, so but the idea is, it does work for us. I mean, as a company, it does work for us. And we do get happy clients, even in our offshore clients. It's like we got a lot of new reference clients. That's why we're so mayabang uh, na. Um, well, go talk to this guy, and they'll say, we're so happy with the team that, and the way they, they develop the software, and uh, it's a continuing relationship. So that kind of thing works, and says, ah, okay, um, if you're so happy with them, maybe you will try it out. And that's the, that's the opening part. It's like also the preparedness of the client and the atmosphere. Yeah. But, I mean, just having all of you guys here is a proof that Agile is catching up. Okay, we had to turn down about 20 people because we couldn't fit them in the room. So there's a lot of interest there. So a lot of people are looking for alternatives. And it's like, um, I guess that's the way it will have to work. It's, it's, um, if you're willing to try, then work with us. So the reason they didn't accept uh, Agile because it's not big speed. Yes. Okay. So it's yes. only It's like, um, mm -hmm. but, not really. You can do Agile in a fix. Yes, in a fixed bit you can do, but... The scope. The scope can... Yeah, what you can do is... You have to work... Because it's, well, as we said, you can fix the scope and the time. Uh, you can fix the time, the, the schedule, and you can um, fix the cost. Because usually if you fix the time and the resources, you can say, well, it will cost this much. No, that's where the definition of done is actually a good question. We'll, something that we'll go back to. Because when you say what's done, then really you need to start talking. Ah, okay, what's really important? Because you can say, well, we'll finish the most important things first. But I guess Bibet's question is if there was a RFP with the feature list. Yeah. Can you do it in Agile? Um, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. Uh, so you have to have the client ready. So there's a lot of lot of client training that goes into it. With us, uh, we train. Even foreign clients, a lot of them are not ready. Uh, a lot of they, they come in saying that we are Agile, but all they need is they have no process. <laughs> really. Uh, so a lot of time, before you start the project, you have to train them. There has been incidents where I flew in, I trained sitting in their room, their entire company, for a couple of days um, before we started the engagement. So it might take that, but you know, the question is, do you want peace of mind and happy client and happy developer, or do you want you know just to do it? And and that's, that's where it comes in. And then the thing is, doesn't work at all. Yes. It's like right now what we're gonna say is it's not it's not a one hundred percent oh this is the solution for everyone. Yeah. This is why we went back to that um, thing about the values. Customer collaboration is very important. It really is. It requires that kind of relationship between the customer and you for you to be able to build a successful project. It's I, I guess even in waterfall it's still uh, a necessary thing, right? For you to work with a good guy. Um, it's just that here it becomes even more important because um, you're telling them what is going on as as the uh, project progresses, and you're saying, "Well, we found a pro we, we found a problem," uh, and it's like 
the client can say, well, that's your fault. You didn't find that problem beforehand. You won't pay for it. That kind of thing. But really, what you need to make them understand is, well, software development is a process of discovery. It's it's never a set thing. Uh, uh, we know ahead of time everything. In, in fact, part of that development process is making the client understand that uh, software development is a somewhat chaotic, unpredictable process. I think the key thing is, not every customer is ready for a custom built software, even though they might be asking for it. Uh, their process might not be well defined. So if you're working with uh, institutions which are very mature, their process is very well defined, uh, it's well documented, you can do it without agile. Because it's it's all set very well. I mean, I'm not saying um, that's the best way. You tell them to buy some. <laughs> but yeah, actually, most of the local small to make clients, they will ask you for custom, but actually, they just need a package uh, with a little tweak. And that's where probably educating them that, you know, you really don't need to build reinvent the wheel. You can just buy it and just, you know, paint in your way. Um, but there are few who want it custom because that's their business strategy, business advantage they want and they should be ready to pay for it. So custom building a software is expensive. Now, it should not be at the expense of the provider. That's, that's, the, that's the thing. We'll move to the next slide. So that's the, so there are, we'll talk about two methodologies for Agile today, uh, Scrum and Kanban. Um, Scrum is little more uh, mature yeah. and a little more process oriented. Kanban is a little less of that. We go through both of those and they have their own benefits. And actually, their proponents fight with each other also. <laughs> so, yeah, so Agile is not just one concept, but they, they do share similar characteristics. Uh, I think those things that we talk about, uh, the concept of customer collaboration, the idea of feedback, the idea software. of iterative development, these are the common things. No? But um, even among them, they do have different tests. Now, um, our, my tendency is, even though it's like, okay, I'm a certified Scrum Master, I, I want to look at other of the, uh, all these other schools of thought and say, well, maybe in this situation, you know, this is more applicable. So it's not like I'm strictly speaking, oh, I, I only follow one set of processes. It's more like what's applicable. And that's one of the things that make you agile, I guess, is understanding that there is no one prescriptive process. There is no, oh, this is the official thing that you should be following. Not like, I guess, um, CMI or where there is a prescription, there is a, a set of steps. Here, it's more like um, agile is about finding what works in your situation. And since our situation is different from your situation, um, and getting that feedback, if this is working, then use it. You know? So it's, and it's about improving as well. Okay, um, now that you're here, now that we're doing this, are there things that you can improve? Um, so Scrum is a set of practices that, that's um, very good because it comes with a set of prescriptions. It's like, well, do this, do this, do this. Few rules. Few rules. Few rules, but the good thing is, once you start actually applying them, you can start playing around and modifying them and say, ah, okay, this is the situation, this is not working, then we'll change it. And it's part of the process to change it, part of that process is changing it, adapting it. Uh, so, want to go? Okay. So, Let's look at this. So that box kind of represents the finished product that you want to build to meet a certain set of goals and objectives of your client. The idea is, can you chop it down into features that can stand on its own, sort of? OK. Can be, right? Yes? After, you know. The whole thing is that then you kind of start sorting, sorting it out. What produces the most value for you, for your client? 
and what is nice to have, but we can live without it for now. So it's a it's a ranking system. If you break it down, then you rank it. But this this is most important. If you can give it to me tomorrow, I'll be you know. And this one, yeah, it's it's nice to have, but I can wait for it or something like that. So that is the ranking. Yeah, and let me just add when. The reason why you want to split it up and rank it is to remember the concept of feedback and, and right, the idea of iterations. The idea is, because there's, thing, there's this thing where, oh, okay, we have iterations, but at the end of the end of the iteration, we show it to the client, the client doesn't appreciate it because he's still thinking, ah, I'll wait until the end. The idea here is we need to convince the client that here, the earlier you can get it, the earlier you can use it, the earlier you can then it. So that's another thing that if the client doesn't appreciate that and doesn't understand that, it's like, okay, why are you why are we doing early delivery? The idea is we want to give you an early version so that you can start using it, you can start benefiting from it, you can start giving it feedback that will be useful in directing. So as we prioritize, as we chop it up into smaller sets of of items. The idea is once we turn it over to the client, we say we built this, we show it to you. What we really want is for them to really start using it and getting benefits from it uh, economically, business wise, so that their future direction will be okay, uh, it's not complete, but I have enough features that it's generating the feedback and it will direct the development of the product. A lot of times they, in the beginning, they might tell you a bunch of features which they can actually live without. Maybe it's a more power user or a, you know someone who has more influence, the loudest voice, etc., who pushed in certain things that just came to their mind or that person probably saw it in his last job or somewhere in the exhibition and they just want those features in. Rather than if that is the real business need and can you live without it. So those kind of questions put up early can be very helpful. And that's that's the logic of that ranking. So yes, the whole thing to be broken down and then prioritized. That's the start. Now, the word, like someone wants this whole thing by more or less April to use. And if we are in January, the way it goes is you start by having shipments early and regularly. Okay. That's the whole concept. So one of the key rules of Scrum is the time box. So you do not call anything a Scrum if it doesn't have a time box. And the time box is either one week up to four weeks. So if someone tells you, yeah, I'm doing a Scrum of six months, or something like that, that's not it. So Scrum, Oh, by the way, the term Scrum came from where? Rugby football. Rugby football, and you know what they what happens is when the game breaks down, someone did a foul or something, so they just throw the ball and everyone hurdles together, and then they kind of run with the ball. So it's it's like to get the ball rolling. Ah, it's loosely based. We don't really do that, though we do us. Yeah, but but there's the concept of first the whole team pushing together, working together to deliver the software. It's, so, it's fail or pass for everyone. So one thing with Scrum is you do not evaluate as much individuals as much as the team. And let the team kick out if someone is not performing. The game changes there. So you, you let them fail as a team. Because remember, you're reducing the risk by bringing it down to weekly. So one of the way we sell to client is to tell them, okay, so you want this project done, which is like 100 man months of work. You want me to do it and come back to you after six months and show you, and then you see if you like it or not. Maybe we are going to make a mess out of it. And what is your problem? You, you only can see it after six months. Would you rather want me to produce output in the first month and that you can use? And if you don't like, cut off my contract. What do you like better? 
that risk management sales was, was blind. We tell them, so one thing with Agile is transparency. You cannot hide what's going on. You let your client see the good programmer and the lousy one. And let them say, I don't want him. Okay, it's gone. Uh, but that's how it is. Let the team decide that this one is pulling us down. You move into another project or moving out. And that's so it changes the whole dynamics. It, it's a different game. But you reduce the risk by so they will say that am I going to give you open checkbook? Yeah, not really. But <laughs> but we're going to give you full transparency. We're going to show you output. And once you see the output, if you don't like it, you cut it off. So that is what converts them to say that, OK, let's try it. At the most, it's two weeks that I'm going to lose money, not six months. So, so there is flexibility in terms of that. And that's why, as a provider, um, we also reduce our risk. Most of us are because then the responsibility really of because what, what happens in trust the world is because they want more than what they yeah. do. What we say, what we tell them is if you want more features, then um, you'll have to increase your cost. So then the onus on them to like determine which features they want falls back to them, which is what you really want because. In terms of determining what the requirements are and what should be included and not included in the software, it should be the client's own, right? It shouldn't be us, because in, 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 there's a tendency for us to, ah, okay, we, we, there's no time to do this, we'll take this out, right? Because we're trying to control the budget. And what happens is we're throwing it back at them. We're saying, look, um, we can only do so much. You can fire us if you really don't like the kind of work that we do or we're too slow. But really, if you're happy with the work we're doing so far, this is how much we can do. And you can either say, well, you have given the uh, amount of productivity of our team, you can have five days. And you can choose those five days for the next maybe two weeks. Uh, and so it's up to the client to then say, well, I got to think about this. And that's an important thing. You force the client to start thinking about what they want. Because most of the time they'll say, I want those 25 things, and they never think about it anymore. But now they're, because it's their money, they, they're forced to think about, okay, which of the five things do I really need? That's most of the time. But you'll find clients who don't want to think about it. It's a red flag, stop it. If they don't want to get involved in selecting yeah. in uh, what we call backlog, that this whole list is called the product backlog. And if they're not involved, if they're not putting enough time and effort in, in curing the backlog, it's a big red flag. Because what it's telling you is that thing that Agile is dependent on, customer collaboration, isn't here. Because this is the thing that they, this, this is how they control the project actually, is by determining what needs to be done, which is their call, right? It's not the private provider's call to determine what features are there. So this thing is very important, that this is controlled by the client, and they need to get their feedback and say, ah, okay, uh, if we have a, we want to deliver something by the end of five months or six months, we need to make sure that you're working on the most important thing so that we can ensure that these things get delivered in those six months. Rule of thumb is about 10% of the sprint duration. So for one week, 40 hours sprint, uh, the client product owner, we'll go to the terminology, should spend four hours with you on curing the product backlog. So again, it's based on customer collaboration. So one of the things that, that you might say, well, Agile will work. One indicator is if the client is willing to work with you on this. It's not a okay. Building it together. Yeah, you're building it really. Customer collaboration becomes really important. Uh, that one. Oh, sorry. What's the payment scheme? Payment scheme. Uh, well, uh, we do it as uh, monthly billing of number of hours delivered. 
for each resource um, against the timesheet which is transparent to them. And that's where the transparent work board, etc., comes into play. They can see every day who is moving which ticket and uh, what, what, what people are working on and how this is contributing. So there's traceability. The okay, the developer is doing this. Ah, this is part of the. Is that how you guys do also? Yeah, more or less. We're, we're too much to do. So that, that is the challenge with some of the local. Yeah, it's PMF within boundaries. So uh, in the beginning, we actually scoped the whole project. Uh, we size it, we, we jointly produce the product backlog. Uh, we confirm with them, and then we kind of you know, do a certain level. So it's not strictly agile what we do, but you know, that's how. That's how, how most of it will work, is because, yes. of course, the idea is the client needs to have a budget or yes. an idea of how large a project will be. And you need also to have an understanding of what the customer needs are in terms of, okay, how large a team do I need to provide? So we do have an initial stage where we do review, but here's the thing. What we give them is something that they need to understand to be an estimate. And an estimate is not wrong. wrong. It's not, it's wrong. not, it's not wrong. wrong. It's an estimate. Therefore, as we discover more, we can refine that estimate. And part of the process of actually maintaining that data is inputting as we discover more things. Like, for example, ah, this is hard. Oh, what we thought was hard was easy. If we incorporate that into the what we call the product. Product. It's a constant change log. Earlier, when there was a change, we used to make the change log. Now, change log is what we work on from day one. So it's like you keep this thing updated uh, based on the feedback of the, the develop, what the developers discover and also what the business users discover. It's like, ah, um, there's a new change because there's a new government regulation we need to put this in and give this higher priority. So that changes the list of things that need to be done first. So the thing is, the product backlog is actually the way you can control the project. This is why it's very it's one of those that is one living document. documents that need instead of requir system requirements documents uh, and all the other kinds of documents that you need to initiate a project or to take control the project. In Agile, there's usually a product backlog, some sort of list of items, a prioritized list of items, or technical terms, ordered list of items. It can be written in a story format, user story. So uh, this user is going to do this and this will happen. So that's generally... Yeah, and the idea is it's something that's not technical. It should be understood by the business users, by the uh, customer. And readable. Human readable. Yeah. Uh, um, this one I'll just yeah. do a short one. So yeah. the product backlog is this one. So this thing went down there, right? And then you pick from the top. So let's say A, B, C, D. Uh, D is gone here. You kind of pull that and you work on it. So uh, a sprint is a time box, uh, one to four weeks. But you don't change one week now, two weeks next, and then. So you choose something. Generally, a little longer in the beginning of the project. You might go down to shorter later. But internally, what we do is one or two weeks. Uh, we don't do three, four weeks. Some people do it. Um, so we do generally two week sprints, and in that two week sprints, what you do is in that time box. So there are certain items which are committed to. So this many stories we are going to try to finish, and you work on it. And then once it's done, uh, remember it's called incrementally shippable. Now. Shippable doesn't mean ship, uh, so it doesn't mean they will put it in production, but it should be nearly as good as production ready. Now it's the call of the product owner, uh, the one whose client representative, that if he wants to already show it to the client or not, uh, whether it has a business value yet or not, that's their call. But on the development team side, your effort is to uh, finish and provide a piece of software that can already be shipped out. So that means if part of your process of making something deliverable is a user acceptance process, then you should be incorporating that in order to make it 
something that you can ship. Because if if you at the end of the the yeah we tested it internally, but at the end before it has to go to the production, it has to go to this space, then you need to incorporate that into your process. You need to have a way so that users can get to test it and say, yeah, this is ready to go. So the idea is the output of each sprint is something you can release. You don't have to release it, but it should be ready for release. Okay. Yes. Can you share um, some best practices on how we can uh, we can make our developers um, potentially capable in such a short amount of time because I recommend that maybe for some projects it takes even up to a month for the release only, for the release of the release only. So, um, can you, you, make it, you make it a small piece of Yeah, the um, thing is, you, story. Yeah, the, the, the key there is the reason why it takes a month is because there's a lot of features. Yeah. But if you break it down to smaller features, then testing that becomes uh, also, also smaller tasks. Like a user user access. So you know, login, password, retrieve password, etc. Might be and the membership management might be the first week's delivery. So but the, by the, the time you give out, yeah. they should be able to there's a digital stuff that we do, like um, which probably we won't be able to cover, but these things like well, because for example, ah you need to use several testing, so a user needs to be able to say uh, I type in my user ID and an invalid password, and it should return this. And that's my user acceptance test. But if every sprint I have to repeat that, that's gonna make the uh, user very mad because, ah, what? I need to do that again? Because remember, the idea is when you ship something, the next sprint, that thing that you ship should be, it's like Same. you need to add on top of it, but that thing that used to work should still work. So you're going to ask basically to. So one of the things that we do is we need to automate those tests. You actually so, write the requirement as a test. Yeah. And so once you say, well, I have an automated test, then I need, I don't need to call you every time. I just need to run the test and make sure that it's fast. So, so there's a lot of yeah. there's still engineering involved. There's still a lot of things that you need to improve. For example, the quality of the code needs to improve in order for this to work. So that. You can deliver incrementally because the idea is, um, for example, I deliver after several sprints, I already have enough functionality. When I need to add more functionality on top of that, all the things that used to work should still work. And the way to check that is to basically test it out. And the way to test it out is if you do it manually, it's going to be hard. So the way to do it is to automate it. So you need to have some tools that will provide you with automation so that. The only the new things need to have added test, the old things just run the test. Ah, okay, everything is still working. So what we have found from our experience, ground. If you do the waterfalls inside Scrum, actually most people do that. You do mini waterfalls in the name of Scrum. It won't work. Uh, you have to evolve your process to be test driven for Scrum to work. You know why, what will happen? Generally, um, so this is the timeline, right? The box. So week one, day one, and then this is, let's say, the 10th working day. So what happens is, so you, you do the whole thing and you finish the build. And if your testing starts off somewhere here, it never finishes, or even if you finish, you find the whole bunch of bugs which you cannot ship the product out. So if the test comes at the end of your build, you will never be able to produce a shippable output. The only way it can work is you build the test here and you work to make the test happen. So as you're building the features, you also make sure that the tests are working alongside the it. So it's a very different, there's a lot of engineering software engineering stuff that needs to change. Um, specifically, I think the biggest one is probably test automation. Uh, so that- We're not talking the expensive uh, yeah, exactly. Mercury or anything like that. Uh, what do you call that? QTP or anything, not like that. There are open source free tools, like we use Fitness, um, if that, you use Robo. Robo. Yeah. Yeah, Robo. So there are 
few tools where you can write the requirement in human readable format and they connect to your development environment and it can be tested uh, without going through the UI but there are still UI issues we'll go to that okay yes Afterwards, say the customer is not acceptable to them, considering that there is a fixed time schedule and also considering that there is already time and for two weeks. Okay. Uh, say the feature is ready for release. So that means that... We don't do release, okay. We only produce in every iteration, let's say two weeks, we will to only produce something that your client, representative, which you call product owner, asks you to build. So if they say, okay, um, for example, uh, difficult, um, you use your access, a lot of systems have user access, so I want to be able to log in, um, but um, let's say the, the user is less, um, the product owner says, oh, we need to implement a remember me feature, so we add that feature in, and if they say they don't want it at the end, Okay, we can take it out. But remember, what? They already paid for that effort. So it's up to them to say, well, we realized that, ah, okay, after getting it, uh, we made a mistake. We don't want that feature. So the developer is okay, that's fine with us. On the other end of it, the remember feature, remember me feature wasn't sold and you did not build. So you produce a shippable output, end of the string, and they say, oh, all this good, but you know, I cannot ship it without remember me. No problem, we'll add that in the next frame. Increase the priority of that. So it's a shippable, it's not necessarily shipped every end of the string. And the idea is, um, if the client doesn't want it, it's like, well, you told us you wanted it, now we built it for you. If you don't want it at the end, then that's also fine. But the thing is, the blame of, okay, you built something wrong, because it's like, we were, we collaborated at the start, you told us you want this, we built it for you, and then, the, and remember, the cycle is very short, there's only two weeks. So memory So it's there. like, the memory is still there. <laughs> you can't say, oh, six months later, you didn't tell us this. It's like, that's the reason why you want the feedback cycle. Sure. And the paper uh, paperwork is still there. The product backlog is a uh, joint document. Sometimes we actually sign on both ends. Uh, so you know, it's it's there. It's specifically written. Step and one, step there two. can be, of course, misunderstanding. And that's also a given. But the thing is, okay, um, the next time we talk about, okay, how can we avoid misunderstanding again? And so the process improves. Trust is key in Agile. Yeah. You have to have trust. If your client does not have trust and don't want to trust you, you're better off without that client. So that's what I'm saying. Because the feedback cycle is so short, it's up to them. It's like you're, they're the ones paying for you to do something that they want. And if they change their mind, they're the ones who are being penalized. That's why they mean, that's why you want them to force, you want to basically force them to that stage where they need to think about what they want you to do because they're paying for it. Yes. So if they don't want it, then they shouldn't ask you to do it. And then they can do it. Okay, in this slide, we're going to touch on some of the nitty gritties and terminologies of Scrum. Um, so time box, we already talked about it, right? The sprint is the time box. So that's a, that's a sprint. So you know, you first produce the product backlog. After you have finished the product backlog, the breakdown, you pick up from the top a certain number of stories to be put in the sprint backlog. The sprint backlog is where you take the stories and you break it down further into tasks. Okay, and while doing this, you involve the product owner. The product owner is the client single point of representation. Now this is key. You cannot have 15 guys talking to the team. You have to force your client to appoint a product owner who will give one point of decision. It cannot be that, oh, um, you know, that guy said that, that guy 